Again, thank you for tuning in to Shishobo, the Grace Bible Church program that brings you into our weekly service when you are unable to join us. This week, Bishop Musa Sono builds on the title message, God's Making Process. Listen carefully as we taught how we can find our purpose and assignment and how to fulfill it. Bishop delves into the porter's process of making, breaking, shaping, and molding us to a point of good works overflowing through us. Take a listen. We are continuing on our theme this month on God's making process. And we're using Jeremiah chapter 18 as our main verse. If you could have it up on the screen. Reading from verse 1. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying... Keep going. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will announce my words to you. I'm reading the New American Standard Bible. Keep going. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on the wheel. But the vessel that he was making of clay was spoiled or marred in the hand of the potter. So he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. Watch that. That's important. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, in verse 6 there, Can I not, O house of Israel, deal with you as this potter does, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of, o house of Israel. So God is using metaphors or analogies to try and explain to us how he works in our lives. And I think this scripture is so good, just keep it there, where we are understanding that God is the potter and we are the clay. And as the clay, God wants to shape us and form us into a vessel. Notice it says, so he remade it into another vessel as it pleased the potter to make. In other words, there is a way in which God wants to make you and shape you so that he can use you as a vessel to serve the world out of. You are not in the world by mistake. You are really not here just to fill up space and breathe in oxygen and increase the hole in the ozone layer. You are here to be a vessel in the hands of God. And so God uses this analogy because before the vessel was made, the potter had to do, to do a number of things, and we have been talking about those. I don't want to go back to them. But we note in, this, uh, in these verses from verse 1 to verse 6, we note about four main things I want to talk to you about. Number one, we note the potter's mission is to make, is to take the clay and make a vessel out of it. That is the mission of the potter. God wants to take you and make a vessel out of you. All right, and note he is taking something that's worthless, something that is useless, clay. This clay, we are told, when the potter harvested it, he got it from the riverbed. And when he harvested it, it was full of stones and sticks and glasses and all kinds of funny things. And this clay, if you took it to the market in that condition, it has no value whatsoever. No one will buy it. No one will show interest in it. God is that way. He finds us as people who have no worth, who cannot be attractive in any way. But God being God knows how to remove things from our lives, to work on us and shape us until we are people of worth. Let's tell the truth, Barcelon. Many of us, Years ago, if we were to go back to what we used to be back then, we were just like this clay. Worthless, no value to us. When you looked at us, we were not so organized. 
We were not so, 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 so great, you know. We were just rough people. You know, you know, we were doing all these things. And when you looked at us, it was like there's really nothing that will ever come out of our lives. And that's what I love about God. Because God never gives up on anybody. And we should learn to be like God and never give up on anybody. And when God saw us, when God met us, when God harvested us, he found us in that condition, but he believed in us anyhow. That's why we need to learn to believe in other people. That's what ministry has taught me. For me, this is what the church has taught me. We need to believe in people. Even if when you look at them initially, they are not impressive at all. You need to believe in them. I found you give people enough time, expose them to the right environment, and if they are willing to learn, if they are willing to be humble, if they are willing to be teachable, then it just takes some time that something good is going to come out of them. Oh, I'm, I'm telling you, about you that something good is about to come out of you you just don't know who you are and that's what we learn that's what I like I mean as I look around the churches as I go around churches you know there are people that some of them I know on a personal level some I know even if it's not personal from a distance but I know when they came some we've had conversations with some came and said this was what happened in my life and I know some people at a certain stage in their lives they were discouraged about what was going on in their lives they didn't think they would ever amount to anything because you were surrounded by so much trouble, so much tragedy. You had done so many wrong things, so many bad things. You had so many bad habits. You had gotten involved with so many bad people. You were around bad company. Your language was bad. The way you thought was bad. Your behavior was bad. People didn't want to be around you. But let me tell you, there is a potter called God Almighty who believes in us. And the potter goes and he harvests. So the mission of the potter is to take the clay and make a vessel out of it. If you will give God enough chance in your life, my brother, my sister, you'll be amazed at what God will do out of your life. The second thing we learn from those verses is that the potter finds the clay and starts working on it. It's not us who found God. It's God who found us. Hallelujah. And when God finds you, he starts working on you. Unfortunately, not many people respond well to God's making process. I'm going to show you as I go through it today. Sometimes, you know, we, 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 we rebel against God's making process. You know, we, we don't like it. You know, we don't respond well. So what happens? We, we end up depriving ourselves to be the best that God wants us to be. You know, we start well, but we plateau somewhere. Because there are certain things when God tries to deal with in our lives, reversible. You know, you know, sometimes people can say, well, God, you can have my heart, but not my pocketbook. Yeah, yeah. God, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can have this part of my body, but not the bottom part of my body. From the belly downwards, no. You know what I'm talking about. Don't give me that look. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, there, there's people who say that. There's people who say, well, God, I'm your child, but I'm going to make decisions about where, what I want to do with my future. Don't ever tell me to save you. Don't ever tell me to do such and such. And so what happens? The potter becomes frustrated because the clay is rebelling. You see? That verse says God wants to make you as, he, as it pleases him. And let me tell you, knowing the way God works, God wants to make you to look so good. Yeah. God, our God, is a God of high standards. Yeah. He really wants to make you so beautiful so that when people look at you, they say, hey, 10 plus. When they look at you, but hey, shaba, yaba, yaba, yaba. When they look at you, and say, hey, what a shock, you know. But some of us, we plateau. And I know in my own journey as a leader, there's areas when I got to them, it was very hard to change. Difficult. Difficult. One of them was this, what we're doing now with planting churches. This was one of the hardest decisions I've ever had to make in my life. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, Vazalam. You know, it was easy. It was comfortable for me to be here in Mopinville and just run this church. You know? 
Because it was growing, and if we could still continue growing, like, hola, 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 and just be, mm, we have the largest church in Soweto, you know. But God said, no, 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 no. You must now start spreading. You must now start training other people. Buying more buildings. You've got to trust for more money. Believe for more. This vision is so big that we don't have enough resources for it. That's not nice. Huh? It's not nice. Now you have to go around the world, go around the country, play a role in the country. When God pushed me and said, you have to start being visible in the country. To get involved in what's going on in the community. That's not easy. The first meeting I went to, and when I was with the community, you know, the community, they're not like you. When I speak, they don't say amen. <laughs> when I stand, they don't get quiet. <laughs> that was hard. That was hard. I remember going home, and I was thinking about God, but I knew God was speaking to me. Many of us, we don't want to respond. Why? Because you see, God's not, God is not committed to your comfort. God is committed to your transformation. God will build you up and build you up. And God is a God of new things. You don't, you don't leave the old. He just stretches you into new unfamiliar territory. But I found there are people who implode. Somehow, I don't know, is it a South African thing or what? We are unable to sustain our achievements. We do well one time, we don't do well the next time. We see it everywhere in, in all kind of things that are long. In business, we do well one time, we're not doing well. Well, business being what it is. But then one school performs well, and the next year it goes down. Churches, it's like this next thing in sports. I mean, look at what's happening at the, on the league. It's a heartbreak. No, 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 no. I'm all, I also have been affected, so don't worry. Don't worry, it's only my son, Dawana, who are happy. I mean, you know. It's like that, Pastor Lana. As human beings, we're like that. So what happens? We are unable to reach certain levels of achievement. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, if you don't say amen, he's going to keep preaching. Just tell them. You, you don't say amen. But you know, I don't know what it is with us. That somehow we reach certain levels and then we choke. And I look at my own leadership and my own journey and I realized the biggest enemy to what God wants to do in my life is not the devil. I know you like to blame the devil for everything, some of you. The biggest enemy to what God wants to do in my life is not even my wife. It's not my children. It's not even you. The biggest enemy is this guy. Mio. And the biggest enemy to the potter making this vessel, a vessel of honor, is the clay itself. Amen. When the potter tries to make us, and it says there, the potter finds the clay, starts working on it. We learn the fourth thing is, the potter shapes the clay as he wills. You can never tell God what gifts to give you. You don't instruct God where he must use you. You never tell God what assignment to give you. We all love comfort. But God shapes us as he wills. And whatever assignment God has given you, whether you are looking after a child who's not well at all, or in your family, you are the only one who keeps things going and everybody is irresponsible and when things go wrong, they run to you. I know you want to be rescued from that family. I know you want to pray them away. But the potter has put you there. Yeah, I'm coming where you are staying. Coming where you live. Yeah. In that marriage, you are the only one who's trying to bring a spark of love. Who's trying to make any sense of a, a, a feeling of love and a feeling of homeliness? And your partner is not buying into it. And your children are not buying into it. And you want to leave, you want to stop praying. And the day you stop praying, the Spirit said, No, keep praying. Look at your neighbor and say, Lauka Tula, he's coming where you are staying. God shapes us as he wills. 
And whatever assignment he gives you, you don't give him an instruction. You don't tell him. He tells you. And all of us, Barcelona, our assignments are very challenging, very difficult. They're not easy at all. Yeah. And this is what I was telling my family. I said, you know, sometimes people want to say to my family, oh, Sham, Udula Alisi, you're always Sham, Sham. And I said, hey, please don't make them feel like they are, you know. Everybody sacrifices. Every family sacrifices. Yeah, I don't want people to make me feel like, oh, Sham, Salasaba Mudibu, Sham, you are without your father, Sham. Hey, Chanda, so man. Everybody sacrifices. We all sacrifice. All of us. In anything God has called us to do. Number four. Then and only then is the fourth point. One, the potter's mission. Number two, finds clay works on it. Number three, shapes the clay as he wills. Number four. Then the opposition party come. Then the potter uses the vessel to his glory. When God has shaped you, it's not for you. I found out. The lowest level of living is to live for yourself. That's the lowest level of living. I'm telling you. The highest level of living is to live to serve others. And some of you, you haven't even, you haven't, you haven't even passed that level yet. And it's fine. All of us, we start, we start like being, you know, you know, children, you know, the classic thing about being a child is a child's way of talking is me, myself, and I. That's all that matters in a child's life. Me, myself, and I. When a child is hungry, they will cry and wake up everybody at three in the morning. They don't care if they're making noise. Because I'm hungry. So everybody must be uncomfortable because I'm hungry. So the world must come to a standstill. Child doesn't mind. It's three in the morning, two in the morning. They don't care. They're hungry. But yeah. But you see, as an adult, you wake up even if you don't feel like waking up because the child needs help. So as an adult, one of the qualities of being grown up and matured is to take care of the needs of others, to put others before you. Hmm? That's why God wants to take all of us. I'm telling you, Basalan, I'm telling you, if you're not serving anywhere in your life, you are losing out on the joy of life. I tell you, you are losing out in, in, in walking in an anointing and in the power of God, which is one of the greatest things. There's nothing better than serving others, and, and God always comes to the party to anoint you with his power to serve others. This is what I've realized. God never anoints you for you. Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He says, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Harry has anointed me for me. Ah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me. Huh? He doesn't anoint you without sending. And he anoints you because he has sent you. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to pronounce deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to announce the acceptable year of the Lord. That's why the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Yeah. God wants the vessel. God wants every one of us to be a servant, serving our world. Whatever area in your life, your family, your community, wherever you are, God wants you to get to that place. That's what God wants to do with this pot. Now, how does God make us? Well, God uses two approaches. And I don't want to say ingredients because that would be disrespectful. God uses his word, the word of God, to shape us and mold us. And we'll go through that. Number two... God uses the power of the Holy Spirit to mold us. I want to give you some practical things today so that when God starts dealing with you in these areas, you'll understand, well, you know what? God is making me. You can recognize that, you know, God is making me. In instead of being the clay that jumps off the potter's wheel when God makes you, you'll stay on the wheel understanding the potter will press me and shape me and put pressure the way he wants. 
So when I feel him meddling with something in my life, I mustn't say, God will use his word and the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our lives to mold us. Now look at 1 John 5, verse 8. It says, there are three that bear witness in earth. Three that bear witness. Now, I won't talk about the, all the three. I'm going to talk about the two, Mara. There are these three that bear witness on earth. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. Now, I don't want to go into the full meaning of everything there, but the blood of Jesus that cleanses our sins, all right? The work of the cross that saved us and made us God's children. When you look at the work of the cross, it will always be consistent and go hand in hand with the, the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will always move you in line with what Jesus did on the cross. Because if it comes from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will always pull you back to become for the, for the, for the Holy Spirit to confirm what Jesus did on the cross. So Jesus, in, I believe it's John 17, he says to his disciples, you are clean through the word that I have spoken to you. You remember that? So when it talks about water, one of the, one of the metaphors, Salen Sulamudimo, or one of the types of God's word is water. Water is a symbol. Water is a symbol of the word. It's not a symbol of the Holy Spirit, but it's also a symbol of the word. So when it says these three bear witness, the spirit, go back to that verse of mine in 1 John, the spirit, the water, and the blood. So we've talked about the blood. The blood is what Jesus did on the cross, right? But then the water means the word of God. This is what this verse means. It means God's word works hand in hand with the Holy Spirit, and both of them work hand in hand with the work of Jesus on the cross. So if you really want to know the accuracy of interpreting the Bible, there is nothing that the word of God will say that will contradict the death of Jesus on the cross. And if you are led by the Spirit, there is no leading of the Holy Spirit that will contradict what the word of God says. They work together. Are you understanding? Yeah? So now I won't talk about the blood, but I'll talk about the water and the spirit. So God uses the word. Watch this now. This is important. And the power of the Holy Spirit to mold us and shape us. That's how he shapes us. He uses his word and he uses the power of the Holy Spirit. Now go with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 11. The words of the wise are like goats and as nails fastened by the master of assemblies which are given from one shepherd. Look at the New English translation. It reads, the words of the sages or the wise are like prods and the collected sayings are like firmly fixed nails. They are given by one shepherd. Now, now here it talks about the words of wisdom that wise people spoke. It says the words they spoke, they are like nails. Somebody say they are like nails. nails. Say it again. But then it says they are given by one shepherd. So this verse not only talks about the words that people speak, it also refers to the words that come from God. So the word of God, therefore, is likened to nails. Speaking, okay? So, what is it that we learn about nails? I mean, if the word of God is like a nail in my life, I mean, how, how, what are the similarities that are there? Well, let's talk about that. The word is a nail. Number one, several things that nails do. I want to talk about all, everything. The first thing that nails do is nails hold things up. Okay, so you take a nail, you nail it in the wall, and it, it, it holds things up. It keeps things from falling. Watch this, Pastor Lan. God will use the power of his word to keep you from falling. 
If you learn God's word, if you study God's word, if you familiarize yourself with God's word, if you believe God's word, if you will depend on God's word, then you'll realize that in times of crisis, even if crisis came, crisis didn't move you away, crisis did not destroy you, even if you thought you'll be destroyed, somehow God held you up. So what happens? Through life and through challenges, you start learning that even when trouble comes, trouble is not going to take me away. And it is in the midst of trouble that you start learning certain things about your God. Ah, you didn't hear what I said. Note what it says here. In, a, in a Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. It says about Jesus, whom, the, whom being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. And it says, and God upholds all things by the word of his power. God upholds all things. The word uphold means to hold it up to keep it from falling. The word uphold means God supports you. God ensures that things that try to drown you don't drown you. Now watch this. How does God make me? How does God make me? Through his word. This is what happens. When I go through crisis, right? And I want to pray the crisis away. God says, no, don't pray the crisis away. Believe my word. Yeah. 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 When trouble comes, I want trouble to disappear. God says, mm-mm. My grace is sufficient for you. You remember what God says to Paul? Paul says, there's a messenger of the devil who has been sent to buffet me. He said, three times I prayed and I asked God to remove this messenger of the devil. Instead of God removing the messenger of the devil, God only told me one thing. My grace is sufficient for you. 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 Paul says, therefore, I have learned to glory in my tribulations. He says, I've learned to take pleasure in infirmities. I've learned to take pleasure in weaknesses. Why, Paul? For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. When the spirit is fed, growth abounds. God wants to grow you and place you where you're meant to be. Get in touch with us and share your thoughts on the sermon via the contact details on your screen right now. Call us if you need our counselors to help lead you into salvation and visit our website for the nearest Grace Bible Church branch you can visit. We'd love to meet you. Till next week, stay blessed.